The Real Investment Show. <laughs> but yeah, first day of fall is upon us. And of course, last night, the House of Representatives worked very hard to get a well, a resolution passed to try to extend the debt ceiling until December of 2022 to get past the next elections and to fund the government at least through December of this year uh, to keep the government from shutting down. This is now going up to the Senate. The Senate has pretty much already vowed that they're going to pretty much block this where it stands. Again, this is uh, all over really kind of haggling over this three and a half trillion dollar spending bill. Of course, the Democrats are now trying to put the blame out there. It's like, well, if the Republicans don't do this, it's going to shut down the government. We're all going to default on our debt. Just relax. No, we're not. Things are going to get paid anyway are all mandatory spending items. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, medi uh, military and interest on the debt all gets paid regardless of the debt ceiling. So. That won't happen and we can we have other alternatives, but there's also no exact timeline as to when the Treasury potentially runs out of money. Um, and that could be either early, mid, late October, even further. It's just kind of a best guess at this point because the daily inflows into the government change constantly. Right now we're in the middle of tax filing season for corporations and individuals that filed extended claims. So. October, from September 15th to October 15th, lots of money coming into the government for tax filing. So again, that kind of extends that, that state of emergency, so to speak. So again, yes, there is a real risk of a debt ceiling here that we're gonna have to contend with, but it's also a reason we have a debt ceiling. And this is one thing people kind of forget. You have a limit on your, debt, on your credit card, right? To keep you from getting too far into debt, right? We give you a limit, we say we can get this limit, you need to pay it off. That's the whole purpose of the debt ceiling. We've kind of forgotten that as we continue to climb higher and higher to debt, 28 trillion and counting now on government debt. The other big news today, of course, is the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve this afternoon will have their press conference following their latest FOMC meeting. Now, this is where they're going to be discussing most likely taper and this idea of trimming the balance sheet. Now, there's a lot of catalysts right now sitting on top of the Fed, so I would expect an announcement of some sort today that says we are going to be moving forward with tapering the balance sheet starting in November or in January of next year, some, some near-term time frame to start tapering the balance sheet. But that's going to come with a lot of caveats. They're going to be saying, well, we'll start taper provided that, A, we get a debt ceiling adjusted, that we get a budget passed, that we have, uh, you know, we're watching global economic growth, watching the Delta variant. You know, they're going to have plenty of issues to put into their statement that will be bullish or what we call dovish for the markets. And again, after the markets have had a big sell-off here over the last, I'd say a big sell-off, markets are down a total of about 5% over the last three weeks. But it's been this rolling correction that has now pulled markets back to extremely oversold conditions. Lots of bearish sentiment in the markets. It's kind of hard to believe after you know a 20% run earlier this year, a 5% correction has gotten everybody bearish. But I told you previously that a correction of 5% would feel a whole lot worse than it actually is because of the low volatility environment that we've been in over the last year. And that's exactly what's been the case. You, you know, when you take a look at, for instance, the fear greed index, it's extremely fearful right now. Investors are just beside themselves with fear. The, uh, Associated, uh, the American Association of Individual Investors, their bearish sentiment is extremely bearish. Again, it's a 5% correction in a market that's, that was up previously 20% for the year. It's, you know, it's hard to suggest that this is really the type of correction that works off things like overvaluations, major extensions in markets, et cetera. It doesn't, but again, it's just how markets are working in a very low volatility environment and one that is driven by very low volume. And you'll notice yesterday, even despite the fact that we did open up on the markets yesterday, we basically quickly sold off, spent most of the day kind of really flopping around uh, neutral all day long and again volume dropping very rapid, rapidly here so as individuals are buying stocks the buyers and this has been the problem for a while and this is why we talk about a low liquidity market is that buyers really aren't buying in heavy volume sellers are there at the right time and sellers show up very quickly and that's why we have these kind of big drops that we saw on monday in the market is because of this really lack of liquidity in markets and when sellers show up there's a big gap in prices and things open down very sharply but the buyers really aren't there there's not a tremendous amount of bu buying volume in the markets and that's one thing that may hinder the market recovery going forward so a couple of things to be paying attention to today in particular 
is going to be whether or not the Senate takes up this debt ceiling bill or they kick it out and that potentially puts more turmoil up in Washington over the fate of our spending capability over the next month. The second thing, of course, is the Fed. That's going to be at 2 o'clock this afternoon. That's going to be the one thing that really kind of moves the markets late afternoon. The what bulls are looking for here in particular is a note of dovishness in the Fed statement. Are they going to taper? Absolutely. The question is when and by how much and how long will it take them to basically unwind the balance sheet? And more importantly, what are the caveats to get out of that tapering capability if they try to do it? And again, things start to slow down much more than they want. So again, as, as we take a look at all, these, uh, at all the events around the world, you've got slowing economic growth. Corporate profit margins have probably peaked here along with earnings. Economic growth in the U.S. is beginning to slow. Consumer confidence is weak and has actually been very weak considering where we are. More importantly, you do have very strong inflationary pressures that are weighing on the consumer as well. And this is one of the bigger problems for corporations and corporate profit margins. PPI, which is the producer price index, is extremely strong and has been running at record rates. CPI also very strong, but PPI is even stronger. And what that suggests is, is that spread between the amount of inflation actually hitting producers and what they can pass on to consumers will start to weigh on corporate profit margins because if they can't pass on that inflation, profit margins have to shrink. And that's one of the things between the supply chain disruptions, the inability to get uh, shipping containers, the prices of those containers, the prices to ship for shipping containers are running the equivalent of cost of 68 Ferraris for three months. So it's extremely expensive to ship. And if that cost can't be passed on to consumers through higher prices, and again, with consumers already struggling to kind of make ends meet, real wages not keeping up with what's going on with inflationary pressures. And even when we look at CPI, and we've talked about this here recently, is that in CPI, we talk about rent, owner's equivalent rent and the rent income that people pay. That's not showing that big of a spike. And that's because that owner's equivalent rent really has nothing to do with what happens really in rents. But if you take a look at the national rent index, it is soaring right now. Rents for homeowners and for renters is going up extremely sharply. That, again, impacts the amount of disposable income that consumers have. And particularly when wages aren't rising fast enough to compensate for that, that slows economic growth, impedes economic margins, weighs on earnings. And all of that is going to be problematic as we get into 2022, particularly for a market that's trading at such high levels of valuations. So that's the quick down and dirty for this morning. When we come back, we'll pick up with Danny Ratliff. Quite a few things to get into this morning. Taxes up on the up on the hill again uh, with a new kind of Democrat proposals talking about new taxes, how that's going to affect you and your money. We'll come back and talk about that with Danny Ratliff right after the break. There was an interesting article that Danny sent me over this morning talking about a prolonged stock market pullback can pose a big risk early in retirement. Here's what you need to know. You know, this is something we've talked about for a while is this whole fallacy of buy and hold investing. And this actually feeds into the other idea that, you know, if you're 25 years old, if you just stick money into the markets, you're going to make, you know, you'll be, I, I saw a clip from uh, Dave Ramsey just the other day. And I, look, I think Dave Ramsey is an awesome debt counselor, nothing wrong, but he made a comment. He said, if you're spending $500 on a car note, if you would take that $500, which I agree with, right? You should not be spending $500 on a car note. <laughs> but if you took the $500 and invested it in a large cap growth mutual fund in 30 years, it'll be worth $5.6 million. And there is some validity to that, but it doesn't really work that way because markets don't compound at 12% a year or 8% a year or 6% a year. And this is often what you see in these articles. They'll say, you know, if you're 25 years old, say $500 a month into your Roth IRA, and if you get 8% a year, you're going to be, you know, a multimillionaire when you get to retirement. If that was the case, there'd be a lot more rich people in the country. But markets don't work that way. They don't actually compound. And when you have losses, and this is one of the things that is, is about this idea, if you're moving into retirement and you're taking on a lot of excess risk and you get into a prolonged stock market downturn, which can happen and will happen at some point, it can really derail your financial plans. 
And, you know, this is something that Danny works on a lot about, uh, you know, talking with clients to, to try to prepare them for these downturns. And, and when you're doing financial plans to, you know, not assume these financial plans, a lot of them are, you know, if you have this much money, you get 6% a year, you'll have 4% withdrawal rate in retirement, you're fine. Problem is, is that doesn't work that way. And using variable rates of return makes a, a, a much better uh, structure to be thinking about retirement. Danny, your thoughts? That's right. I mean, so often we see there's no sequence of return risk within these plans that a lot of people generate. And, you know, like you said, if you can make 6% every year and withdraw four, you're in the money, you're doing pretty good. And, you know, that'd be great in a perfect world where we can rely on some fixed income or fixed type of, of rate. Unfortunately, that's not the world we live in. That's not the world we've ever lived in. We've always had these variable rates and we need to be realistic within these plans. You know, I'm seeing all kinds of headlines with, you know, obviously taking advantage of this little pullback we've seen here recently, you know, a boomers may be uh, drawing down retirement faster than once thought. Well, yeah, of course, we're at ultra low interest rates. We're not being realistic within a plan. And not to mention how many people out there actually don't have a plan. Right. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of people who are kind of winging it with a, with a pen and a, and a spreadsheet, right? Um, and, and that's okay, too. But we need to be realistic. We need to understand how markets actually work. And you look back, you may look at a fun fact sheet, and I, I get this often, and they say, wow, look at the, the average rate of return on this. I say, well, yeah, but how long are we going back, number one? Number two, you know, we couldn't find those rates of return two, three years ago when they still included 2008. Now they're everywhere because, yeah. you know, we're past that, especially when you look at the 10-year because that's, that's what most of them are reporting as yes, it is. So we got to set those realistic expectations when we invest and understand how to withdraw um, where to take funds from, and then be realistic. How long will you actually live? You know, many plans say you're going to go to 100. I hear many people say, well, I'm not living past 80. Nobody in my family lived past, you know, 75. But we're finding that that's not the case. People are living longer and longer. Yep. Well, you know, you hit on a, a, a pet peeve of mine, that, and this gets put around a lot in the media, talking about, these rates of return from funds and they'll say you know if you take a look at the spiva index right or, and there's an annual report from s p about spiva which is the uh returns of passive versus active fund managers and you know it's it's fine it's a fine analysis and what it goes to show you is is that passive outperforms active over time and you should just be a passive indexer and you're fine just ride the markets up and down there's a lot of fallacy with that because, again, when you take a look at fun, fun fact sheets, right, and they say the 1, 3, 5, 10, 20-year returns, that assumes that you bought that fund exactly one year ago, three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, and you bought and held it that entire time frame. That's how you get that return. That's not the way it really works. If you happen to buy the, the year before you know, a, a, you know, for instance, if you go back to 2000 is a good example, right? There were plenty of funds with 10 year track records that were stellar. They were dot com funds. They were great funds. Um, you know, and, and Fairhome Fund was another big winner. I mean, it was, you know, these were funds that people were just couldn't wait to get their money into. 10 year returns were fantastic for that period of time. The next two years were terrible. <laughs> a lot of these funds didn't exist after the next two years. And, and that's the real key. It's not, it's not about track records. And this is where people get very lost in when they're making investments. They go, well, how have you done over the past you know, five years or 10 years? It doesn't matter. That's what that, what am I going to do going forward? That's the question you want to know. That's the answer you want, not how you did in the past, because inevitably, if you buy whatever performed well in the past, you're probably buying into the peak of some investment cycle that's about to underperform. And Callan, uh, Callan does an annual study um, on, you know, different things, uh, sectors and, and funds and markets. And what you find is, is that with regularity, whatever was trading in the top five or 10 percent of returns over one, two or three years tends to wind up at the bottom of returns in the next two or three years. And, and this is important for investors to understand is that it's, it's easy to chase performance, but you wind up buying what was working, not what is about to start working. 
I think it's a really good point, Lance. If you look at kind of that quilt sheet, and you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. kind of a heat map, and you see year after year where some of the, the worst performers become the better investor, better performers, and then vice versa. And I think that's really important to take into consideration. You know, when I first started in the industry, it was right about the time you were just talking about, and I, I was at a big brokerage. I walk in, they, they hand me a big old magazine and say, hey, here's some people to call, sell some investments. I thought, oh, geez. <laughs> I mean, I was literally as green as you could be, and thinking this is not the, the proper training scenario here. But as you start to go through here and I was asking questions, I said, well, just find that one that had really good returns. Mm -hmm. And now had I had done that and some of these were, I mean, if you remember back aim investments, some of oh, these yeah. big firms that were focusing on technology and returns were 90%, a hundred percent. And so ideally for most people, it's probably a pretty easy, Oh yeah, this thing did great. I want in that. And that's unfortunately how most people invest. Um, I do think we've we've kind of adapted over time where we're getting smarter and smarter about these things. But that's still human nature. We want to be in something that's really, really good. And unfortunately, that strategy is not the best strategy. I mean, you talk to many people, they say, look, we've ne we've never made money. And it's usually because we, you know, you're investing with emotion more so than mm -hmm. with, you know, a thoughtful process. And so I really like what you mentioned to I me. Mean, I do think it's important to understand, you know, looking back historically to some extent, so you can get a better feel, especially when you look at a broad money manager. But when you're looking at a, a fund or something of that nature, we've got to be really cautious. Um, and also, you hit the nail on the head when you said strategy. What is the strategy? Do you have one? Mm -hmm. Are you just going to typically buy and hold and ride it out? Which, unfortunately, that's what many do, and it's an easy strategy to, to adapt to because, hey, you're never really wrong. You're always in, and, hey, markets go down. Unfortunately, when markets go down and you need to take a distribution – that's when it hits home, and that's when it impacts that plan long term. Well, and the other thing too is that going back to the plan and and talking about. I'm actually writing an article on this. I'm going to have out in the next uh, week or so because there was a um, another article that was written talking about you know market timing is the death of returns. And and again, there's a big misnomer about market timing, and that assumes that anybody that actively manages money. Um, in terms of managing risk and exposures, these type of things, they must be market timers. And that's not the case. Market timing means you're all in or all out. So you're you're putting 100% of your dollars on Apple and you're betting it's going to go up and then you sell it and you're out and then you're looking for the next trade. That's market timing. That you can't do consistently. Nobody can. You may get lucky a couple of times, but to consistently market time doesn't work. Managing risk does work. And, you know, and, and avoiding downturns is critically important, particularly to a financial plan, regardless of whether you're 25 or 50, those downturns have two implications. One, it destroys capital. So you had a million dollars in your account, you drop it to 800,000. Well, you've got to get it back to a million again, just to be back where you were. Well, that takes time. And that's time that you don't necessarily have. We don't get more time. The time that we use getting back to even isn't making us money, but here's the other problem with it. Our plan said we had to make 6% a year. So if it takes us two years to get back to even, that's 12% more, 6% for each year, compounded, which is actually now 13, 14% that I've got to get back just to get back on my plan. So it's incredibly important long-term financially to avoid those downturns and to mitigate risk as much as possible. Riding markets up and down is fine, but you'll wind up missing your financial goals every single time. Be right back after the break with Danny Ratliff. You know, the one thing that we tend to get away from is understanding risk. And, and this is particularly problematic when you have a very long bull market like we've been in now um, over the last 12 years. The market just goes up. What risk? And... You know, this is where you start seeing things like we see on TikTok right now. Um, there was an interesting Bloomberg article out earlier this week talking about these young Gen Zers that are on TikTok making half a million dollars a year telling people how to trade. And what's interesting is, is they may be trading, but that's not where their money's coming from. They're not building, the, you know, they're showing their, you know, their lifestyle and their flashy cars and whatever it is. But the money's not coming from their success as traders. The money's coming from their advertisers that they're advertising for. So if you watch these guys, they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm trading this stock. By the way, put your money over with Wealthfront, as an example, who's a robo-advisor that's just buy and hold. So it doesn't really even kind of make match up to what you're doing. But, you know, that's that's what kind of what's going on here. But that's what happens in very late stage bull markets where there's lots of exuberance. Markets just go up. Seems easy until things don't. And bear markets are... You know, we, we kind of get into these, 
you know, the kind of these nomenclatures for markets, a you know, bull market. What's a bull market? Bull market simply means that prices are going up. Why do you call it a bear market? Because when a bear market happens, is extremely fast, and it's like a bear attack. It, it, it mauls you and knocks you down and, and tears you up very quickly, and then it's over, and he walks off. If you ever watch the movie Revenant, you'll understand. <laughs> um, but that's why it's, it's a bear market, because it's a very grueling, brutal event that doesn't last very long. And, and so people go, well, don't worry about bear markets. And, and one of the charts that you'll see thrown around a good bit is it shows the percentage return of bull markets versus bear markets over history. So it'll show you these bull markets that are up, you know, a thousand percent, two thousand percent, you know, whatever. And then it shows you these little these little bear markets on the bottom that are just down 40 percent or down 50 percent. So why worry about a bear market that's down 50 percent when you just had a bull market that was two thousand percent, right? That's pfft, nothing to worry about. Well that's very deceiving because if you lose 50 percent of a 2,000% advance, you gave up half your money. Not half the gains, you gave up half your wealth. And that's the big difference that people don't talk about. If you go back throughout history and look at the point returns, how many points did the market go up versus how many points did the market go down? They're almost identical over time. In other words, bear markets tend to take away the majority of your gains from the previous bull market when they occur. And this happens repeatedly throughout history. So it's a, this is why bear markets are so important to understand and so important to manage the risk of. You don't know when they're going to happen. You don't know how they're going to happen. But when they do happen, they happen so fast. It's like a bear attack. You simply don't have any chance to escape it. And that's the real warning that you need to think about with your money because the losses, as Danny was talking about, is if my plan calls for a 6% rate of return for me to reach my, reach my financial goals and I lose half my money, I am not going to reach my financial goals. It doesn't have to be half. It can be 30%. It can be 40%. It can be 20%, and you won't reach your goals. And that's the important thing to understand. It's time. It's capital, it's capital growth. And ultimately, it's about return on investment. But those three can't exist without the risk of a major drawdown, which is the part you have to focus on the most. A lot of people are able to take advantage of some of these these big events that we've seen as of you know the last 20 years, right? The tech bubble, uh, the bust there, the dot com bust essentially, and then you know 2008. And so many people didn't feel it as you're an accumulator, you're putting funds in, and a lot of times we fail to to realize how much we've actually put in, or or an employer has the funds that we put aside, and we account it and say, wow, this is a great year. Look at all this growth. Well, a lot of that was you. That's your human capital. Nice. And when you turn that off. That's a big difference. And now if you're you get into a retirement year and you're taking these distributions and you see these big drops and you actually experience that, now you start to really, you know, that's a big impact to that financial plan. And so, you know, if, if there's anything that I think that if you're listening, you should take home is one, get a plan, make sure it's realistic, use some realistic numbers. What happens if you experience a drawdown in those first couple of years of retirement? What happens in each and every year, we're actually moving that. We're, we're making a change with that. And so, you know, for our clients each year, we're going to assume that there's going to be a big drop here at some point. And so I, that should give somebody a little bit of peace of mind. Also, use some realistic life expectancy results, right? And I know you say, well, what is that? How do I get there? Um, you know, many people can say, hey, a lot of plans run to 100, and then you're eating ramen noodles. <laughs> and, you know, that's no fun, right? But Go to Living to 100, it's livingto dot com, and take their life expectancy quiz. We have our clients do that. It gives us some more realistic data. So that's a point you can take, kind of stick in your pocket, look and see what you can, you know, what's your life expectancy. And that kind of helps you plan for a lot of things within that financial plan, Lance, not just for market returns and, you know, expectations on how long your funds will last, but how you should take Social Security. Um, what does a pension look like? Is it... You know, do you take that defined benefit plan as a lump sum or is it better for you to take that um, as that actual pension? I mean, there's so many different questions and things that we look at within these. And, you know, how to marry that all together is really extremely important, Lance, and not just from the, the money management side, but all of those things that are moving parts. Yeah, I took that living to 100 quiz. I said I was already dead. So 
said I should retire now because I just don't have much time left. Oh, I know that's not true. <laughs> I, I made sure I knew I knew when you were getting on there. <laughs> so, but yeah, this this is all very important stuff. And again, I know it's a little bit boring. It's a little bit rehashed. But you know, it's when you get into these periods of the markets to where you start to actually see, oh, oh, there really is volatility. Um, this is where investors start to make some mistakes, and this is why you know it's important to kind of just readdress some of these issues that you know it's easy to get swept up into the hype of the markets and you watch you know CNBC and it's like oh markets are up today and as soon as you have one down day it's markets in turmoil and you know it's 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 very emotionally gripping right so it kind of whips you around it's like oh my gosh should I sell everything today no that's not mo- that's not money management right money management is just about managing risk so you know this is what we talk regularly about we oh we took some profits we raised some cash we added to our fixed income exposure to hedge off some of our portfolio risk um, that's, that's the process of active management that over time, yeah, you may not beat the market every year, but that's not the goal. Who, whoever said that money management, you had to beat the market every year. This, this is something that wall street tells you in order to sell your product. The goal is not to beat some random benchmark index. By the way, if you're 50, 60, 40, having a hundred percent exposure to equities probably isn't the best idea to start with. Right. So why are you benching yourself to an all equity index that pays no taxes, has no has no distribution requirements, has no fees, has no you know internal expenses that you that you have to pay out for, you know, has none of that. It has no relation to what your portfolio is doing. So, you know, invest your money to grow your money. That's why we do this. But don't put some unrealistic expectation on that growth because it requires you to take on way too much risk and risk is fine. As long as markets are going up. And I, I told Brent the other day, I've been using this example for a while about what risk is. And risk is basically jumping out of an airplane without a parachute, right? And so, you know, if I jump, that's a lot of risk. And then some guy actually did it and landed in a net. So I can't use that excuse anymore. <laughs> I can't use that example anymore. But, you know, this is, you know, risk is how much you lose when you're wrong. And you can jump out of the airplane without a parachute and hopefully have a net at the bottom and hopefully you'll hit the net. But if you don't, that's risk. And that's the inaction, that's the part that we tend to forget. We, the markets and the media tell us to equate risk to return. The more risk you take, the more money you'll make, right? That's what the media tells us. What risk is, is how much money you will lose when you're wrong. That's what risk is. And that's when we play poker. You know, it's interesting. We, we very quickly separate risk and reward when we play a hand of poker or blackjack, whatever it is. I've got a bad hand. I don't bet much or I fold. Why? Because the risk is I'm going to lose my money. So why bet on it? But we do it every day in the stock market without expectation. Having that strategy where you do raise some cash gives you a couple of different advantages. So number one, if the market does deteriorate further, um, you do have cash that you can you can live on, right? The other aspect is, is that how many people can actually buy that dip? Not many, because if you're riding it all the way up and all the way down, you're kind of stuck. And that's where if you have a strategy where you can raise some some capital over time, take some profits. You know, I know we like to use the analogy of trimming the garden. And I think it's a really good good way to look at it, right? You, mm-hmm. you have a bad one, you have a weed, you pull it at, at some point, you know, you, you cut your losses. Um, but you, you know, you're eventually going to take that rose off that, that out of the rose garden, right? You want to trim it. That's why you have these things. And so same thing with profits. I think that's really important to make sure that you have a strategy to give you that protection, but also give you that flexibility when those events do occur that you can utilize some of these these funds. And look, everybody wants to say, well, well, Lance, I know you hear this all the time. Yeah. You didn't buy it at the very bottom. <laughs> exactly. What in the heck? You didn't buy the dip. You waited till it came just up a smidge. Yeah. And, and, and the reason you're doing that is obviously because who wants to catch that falling knife? Right. Well, and I think that's difficult. Yeah, and again, you know, what's the number one rule in investing? Everybody says it all the time: buy low, sell high. Every major, yep. every major, you know, great investor over time had the same philosophy in one form or another. You read the rules of anybody, right? It's buy low, sell high. But yet, buy and hold is never buy, never, never sell, just buy. It's it's you know it's it's counterintuitive to the whole process of investing over time, but. It's a great way for advisors to have like an armchair approach to managing money. Oh, just put your money in this allocation, hold it, we'll charge you a fee for it. You don't need an advisor for that. You can do that yourself and save yourself the money. Be right back after the break with Danny Ratliff. Don't go away.
All right, we uh, pretty much killed the whole uh, investment strategy thing this morning. So if you didn't get that message, do a repeat of the show. (laughs) You got it covered. I do have an article coming out on it here very soon. So we'll have that for you as well. Um, Speaking of that, also our daily commentary is out on the website this morning as well, talking about the oversold condition of the market. So simply go by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the daily commentary link at the top of the page. Uh, there's a banner on the right-hand side. If you want to subscribe to it, just you click on the link, put your email address in. We'll email it to you every morning at 7.30 before the market opens so you know kind of how we're thinking and what we're looking at to, to kind of prep for the day, what actions we're looking to take. Um, it's all on the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Plus, if you have questions, comments, want to you know, talk to Danny, just send us an email. But, but while you're why, on the why, website, why are you goes- laughing? Why, Brent, uh, no, what, nobody wants to talk to Danny? No, people love to talk to Danny. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, were, you were laughing when I'm I being, said that. I'm being supportive. Oh. He laughs at you to be supportive. <laughs> it's a positive. Hey, much appreciated. <laughs> positive response. Hey, there you go. But, but while you're on that website, go sign up for our next Lunch and Learn. We actually had an event here this last weekend. Um, it was great being out, seeing people once again, alive, in person. But we're going to do this one as a webinar. Um, and this is going to be, you know, what you can do within your retirement plan to make sure that you're putting funds aside, you know, tax efficiently, Things to look at. Also, if you're a business owner, Tom Allen is going to be on. Uh, he's our retirement plan consultant. He's going to be talking about things you can do as a business owner to, to capture, make sure you're taking advantage of all the benefits as an owner, putting funds aside, tax advantages, retention for employees, all of these really important things. So go sign up at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's going to be on September 30th, next Thursday, uh, not tomorrow, but the following. So we'd love to have you there. And, um, you know, we're going to keep it pretty open format as well, like usual. So if you have questions, you can kind of shoot from the hip and uh, we'll give you we'll give you kind of an unbiased answer. But Lance, you know, one other thing before we, we put that complete investment strategy to bed. And I want to mention one thing on markets is I'm getting lots of calls this week, as I'm sure you're, you are as well, mm-hmm. about, oh, my gosh, the Dow's down 800 points. And years ago, that would have been awful. Right. I mean, you remember, I think this was back. I, I can't remember if this was 07 or, or what year it was, but the market went down like 777 points and it triggered the circuit breakers. Everything shut down. Yeah, that was Lehman, and, that was Lehman in 07. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, wait. And, and, sorry. And, and so we had a handful of events similar to that. But back then, that was huge. Mm-hmm. That was a that was a big deal. Now, 800 points is 2 percent. You know, so so just want to kind of put it in perspective. When you look at the markets, these two percent swings are not, you know, we're we're they're not unusual. Maybe in the last year, but in a grand scheme of things, they, they're things we've experienced, you know, many many times. Those numbers make it seem that much worse because, yeah, those are big numbers, and that's what they used to be really big. But the market is so much bigger now. Mm-hmm. We need to put that in in the in the perspective. Yeah, and that's and that's that's a great point. I mean, one thing that you know, that, that has happened because you, we've run the markets up so much to your point is we've also don't understand this problem of, of liquidity. And we've talked about this repeatedly is that there's simply just no buyers out there. And so when you have a day where they're selling, and this is what happened last March. Um, and again, we saw it just uh, this past Monday is when the sellers show up and everybody wants to sell at one time, the buyers are a lot lower. And that's why the market is down, you know, 800, 900 points, 1,000 points. And to go back to March of 2020, we were down 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 points in a day. And this was part of that lack of liquidity. And, and yeah, it feels terrible when you're looking at the screen. It's just red everywhere. And you've got, you know, people on CNBC running around with their hair on fire, markets in turmoil. But you've got to kind of step back and go, where am I really within the context of things? How far have I come versus what am I actually giving up right now? And to help limit that emotional swing. And that's that's the biggest challenge for investors and why investors underperform over time and wind up missing goals is because they react emotionally. And we've talked about here over the last couple of days about carrying an umbrella. The, the re, you know, we may be taking profits and raising cash early and the markets are still going up and you're going, well, you're missing out. Well, yeah, maybe, but I can always put cash back to work. You know, if I, if I'm, if I think there's going to be a correction or the risk is too high and I can take some money off the table. Great. If I'm wrong, I can always put money back to work and sure I miss a little bit of the gain, but really what did I give up? 
Now the problem is for a lot of investors is they're down 5% in their portfolio. Now they're trying to figure out what to do. And as Danny said earlier, they didn't sell anything. So they have no cash to invest. You can't buy low if you didn't sell high. So one of the, the big advantages of having a regular process of, of raising cash and rebalancing risk is that when there's opportunity, and we, we did a little bit of this yesterday, we saw some opportunity in stocks that we own that we really like a lot, and we bought some more of them yesterday. And we're probably going to do some more today or tomorrow after we get past the Fed. So, you know, this is just the, 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 the value of money management. And this is when you go talk to an advisor, this is what you pay for is somebody to manage that unemotionally for you, be willing to step into the fire and buy when you, sh when you wouldn't personally be buying because you think the markets are going down more. That's what you have an advisor for. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So speaking of an advisor and, and what we typically talk about on Wednesdays is taxes, right? I mean, that yep. seems to be top of mind, you know, lots of calls about taxes, what to do. Um, I know probably the majority of emails I'm seeing right now are, you know, what, what do we do in this event? And, you know, a lot of it is difficult because we're still waiting and it's a moving target. You know, we had our retirement right lane last weekend and, you know, we, we were talking, we talked a lot about taxes on, you know, how you can mitigate taxes, uh, things you can do right now to pre in preparation of potentially higher taxes and things we've always talked about, mm -hmm. but then, you know, spend some time on, you know, what that actually means at the moment. And the difficult part is like, we tried to put a slide together for this. But every day you're sitting there changing something. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? We're going to shoot this from the cuff here because, um, you know, by the time we actually put this up in the PowerPoint, it's going to be completely different. Right. And, you know, some things, though, have remained pretty, pretty steady here, Lance. You know, if we look at, you know, tax brackets, those have increased. Um, you know, they're proposing the increase from 37 to 39.6 percent. They're changing some of the, the numbers there as far as what in earned income you need for that. Um, a big thing is capital gains. Um, you know, capital gains is going to be one of those bigger things where we're changing that from 20 to 25 percent. Um, there's also going to be some additional taxation depending on what the income is. And so there is some good. There's also some good how businesses can uh, potentially amortize expenses over time. Um, the issue is, if, you know, like the tax foundation, many other corporations or excuse me, tax foundations or uh, that's actual actual name of this this group. But uh, other groups who study this and, and bipartisan groups are finding that you know, they're holding their end of the bargain saying that we're not going to increase taxes for those making less than 400,000. However, all of these things add up to something that is going to have that trickle down effect. Mm -hmm. And where, you know, like you've talked about time and time again, that this is an issue. And, you know, I think that over time, we're going to see some, some problems with this in that, you know, People are going to have to reduce costs. If you look at the corporate tax rate, you know they actually have a a um, you know it, it's it's similar to what we have with our tax. Instead of just a flat tax, mm -hmm. it's going to be um, you know it's going to be an effective tax depending on what that income is. And now, granted, some people are going to going to benefit from this potentially, but many aren't. And this is going to hurt people. It's going to hurt the workforce. I mean, there is estimates and studies showing that this is going to cost seven hundred forty five thousand jobs. Yeah, um, it could be much greater than that. What's the economic impact? I haven't seen one study that says this is good for GDP. <laughs> well, look, I mean, the bottom line is simply this, is that the bottom 20% of the economy, they spend roughly 80% of their income just making ends meet. Now, that, now that doesn't mean that they, they're saving 20% of their money. They're not. They spend – the bottom 20% of the economy lives on more than 100% of their income. They need government tax credits. They pay no taxes, right? They actually get money back from the government every year, and if it wasn't for that, they would be in poverty, period. So – you know, when you raise taxes at the top end, that raises costs. And while the lower, while we while we run around and say, "Oh, we're just going to raise taxes on the on the wealthy," that sounds great. The problem is, is you raise costs on everybody else, so the effective tax rate goes up for everybody. And if wages aren't keeping up with those costs, you have a bigger impact to the economy. This is the one thing that economists always forget: is you know, the impact of higher costs. If you and we've talked about this before on the, on the air. If you want to, if you want to collect more tax revenue, change the tax code. Don't change the tax rate. You could charge everybody a ten percent tax rate, and actually collect more revenue for the government at a ten percent flat tax. If you got rid of all the deductions, now you got to be careful with that because we don't want to destroy our charitable organizations, which are vastly dependent on charitable donations for those tax deductions. By the way. 
um, you know, to, to do good work. St. Jude's is a good example. They just raised almost $200 million uh, with Elon Musk's um, Elon Musk uh, civilian flight into space. That's awesome, right? And, and Elon Musk is going to match $50 million into that, that foundation for St. Jude's. That's awesome, right? But he gets a tax deduction for that. And so St. Jude's would not benefit if it wasn't for the tax deductions that we get for charitable contributions. So we do have to be careful. It just can't be willy-nilly how we go about this. But there are a lot of tax loopholes and tax avoidance uh, options within the IRS tax structure that could be fixed. And we could collect more revenue without raising more taxes. And that would actually not impact. That would actually be beneficial to the economy and wouldn't impact you're the 70 the 70 percent of the population that generate almost 90 percent of your consumption and gdp so but again this is this is kind of what you know it's it's easy to run around waving your arms in congress and senate saying we need to tax the rich more and you could be like aoc and get a dress from a woman who hasn't paid taxes in five states um, <laughs> and you're at a thirty-five thousand dollar a plate dinner. I mean, come at on. a thirty-five thousand dollar plate dinner, you might. Wanna... I want to know who's paying for that, though, Lance. Seriously, who's paying for that? Uh, you are. Well, Your tax dollars paid for that thirty-five thousand dollar donation plate. So, there you go. But yeah, so be careful who you have to make your dress as well. Make sure they paid their taxes. <laughs> But anyway, all right, wraps up show for today. I'm Rose Lance Roberts, Danny Ratliff. Uh, get by the website, like Danny said. Our, our events are all listed on the website. So if you want to join our event next Thursday, uh, just simply subscribe there. Send us questions, comments, and emails, our latest blog posts, daily commentary, videos. It's all on the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. Have a great day. See you back here tomorrow. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet. Sign up for the Real Investment Report now at realinvestmentadvice.com. It's a rich man's world.